In this episode, we're going to talk a lot about slavery, racism, and vaginal regions. So, forewarning. (laughs) Women. (laughs) Gynecology. Yes. So, if you don't want to listen to any of those things, like, no harm, no foul. Healthcare horrors. Murder. Welcome back to another episode of Healthcare Horrors. Welcome. My name is Alicia Caracella. I'm a training and development specialist. I'm Ashley Boyce, a brand specialist. And I'm Dolan on the knobs, all at Atlas Med Staff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We are looking for the energy. It has been a long week, so we say. So we're going to talk about James Marion Sims, and hopefully, you know, this sparks some passion in us when we hear about all the terrible things he's done (laughs) and the injustices so right right you know uh last time was just a super quick episode on steven letter so just throwing that out there it was but yeah james we have a lot more to talk about all right let's get into it do it so james marion sims or j marion sims also we will refer to him as Sims, because that is a lot to say, (laughs) was born on January 25th, 1813. So we're throwing it back a little bit. And he is an Aquarius. And apparently, Aquarians who are born on January 25th specifically are difficult to know, cloaked in mystery, always holding something in reserve, dreamy and introspective, and they have magnetism and charm, and they have a profound sense of their destiny. So we will we'll see if any of that is true about Mr. Sims. Mm-hmm. So James Marion Sims, who preferred to be called Marion, was born in Lancaster County, South Carolina. He was the son of John and Mahala. They called her Mackie Sims. His father, Colonel John Sims, was, um, he was from Texas, and he participated in the War of 1812, and he was stationed in Charleston, South Carolina. So his paternal grandfather was one of Marion's men. His great-grandfather was with Washington at Braddock's defeat. So we're getting a history lesson here. Mm-hmm. His maternal grandfather, Charles Mackey, was taken prisoner by Benastre Tarleton and would have been hanged, but his wife intervened and somehow saved his life. So that would be an interesting story that I would like to hear. And that's how John and Mahala met, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, interesting. And, then, and then they fell in love. <laughs> so for the first part of Sims's life and childhood, they lived in Lancaster Village, which is north of Hanging Rock Creek, South Carolina, where his father owned a store. Sims um, later took an account of his early school days there. It sounds like he had an overall really quiet, decent, good outdoor childhood. Um, as in, well, in 18, 1800s, what else was there to do but be outdoors? Mm-hmm. So his father was elected the sheriff of Lancaster County in 1825. Due to this, apparently, he sent Sims away to a school called Franklin Academy in 1832. After two years of studying at the University of South Carolina, South Carolina College, um, where he was a member of the Euphradian Society, Sims worked with Dr. Churchill Jones in Lancaster, South Carolina. He took a three-month course at the Medical College of Charleston, but found it too rigorous, so it was too hard for him. So instead, he moves to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1834, where he enrolled at the Jefferson Medical College, and he graduated in 1835. He's been described as a lackluster student who showed little ambition after receiving his medical degree it didn't say this anywhere like that i read but i feel like he just came from money if his dad was in the military and then like a store owner and then a sheriff and they could afford to send him to an academy Mm -hmm. and he was just i don't know more money than a lot of other people at the time. sounds like they definitely had some cash yes so and as he put it after he Received his medical degree, he said, I felt no particular interest in my profession at the beginning of it, apart from making a living. So this is just about money. Mm -hmm. 
I was really ready at any time um, and any moment to take up anything that offered or that held out any inducement of fortune because I knew I could never make a fortune out of the practice of medicine. So basically, there was no other way to make a ton of money at the time other than to be a doctor, and that was his draw to becoming a doctor, to becoming a physician, which is crazy because you want your practitioner to care about you. Yeah. And not just care about making money. Yeah, or leaving behind a legacy, basically. Sure. Absolutely. (laughs) So he returned to Lancaster to practice, and when he did so, he had no clinical experience at that time and had logged no actual hospital, hospital time yet and had no actual clinical experience diagnosing any illnesses of any sort. So what happens next is his first two patients are infants and they die which not quite sure exactly what happened there yeah not a lot but it was 1835 and he took his first house call with like you said he didn't have any business like really treating anyone yet because he hadn't even so clinicals must not have been a thing yet (laughs) yeah so he just takes his first house call for an immediate emaciated infant who had swollen gums and um, a lot of diarrhea it sounds like and he was able to treat the inflamed gums I guess by making like a little incision on the gums or releasing some pressure but he didn't really know what else was going on with the the boy Um, so Sims referred to all of his medical books and just trial and error just kind of continued to treat the kid and try different things um sadly the boy did die and this was actually a baby of the mayor Mm. and i'm kind of surprised this didn't really hurt his reputation or he didn't really have any there weren't any repercussions because yeah shortly after that he just tried again there was another house call with another infant with similar symptoms and he just went back to the books, trial and error, tried things, and the boy passed away again. And, yeah. Sounds like a little dehydration, some dysentery. Not a doctor, but just maybe <laughs> off the top of my head here. Just give the kids some water. what could have been happening at the time. Some breast milk maybe would have been the key trick here. But, yeah, so that's unfortunate. So after all that happens, he's allegedly distraught over it Mm -hmm. but more or less i think maybe he's embarrassed yeah before treating the second kid he even said like if the same thing happens if i fail again then i will move basically like exile myself gonna run away so he did he left and he set up a new practice in mount meigs near montgomery alabama so he described this particular settlement to his future wife in a letter her her name is Teresa Jones but so he sends this letter to Teresa Jones his future wife and he says it's nothing but a pile of gin houses stables blacksmith shops grog shops taverns and stores thrown together in a promiscuous huddle (laughs) so I mean I like the way they talk back then it's very descriptive I'm very into that so he was in Mount Meigs from 1835 to 1837 so not very long So Sims visited Lancaster in 1836 to marry Teresa Jones, who he had met many years before when he was still a student at Lancaster. So she was the daughter of B.C. Jones. That's all we get. Dr. Churchill Jones. And the niece of Churchill Jones (laughs) and had studied at the South Carolina Female Collegiate Institute. So in 1837... Sims and his wife, Teresa, moved back to Alabama to a place called Kubahatchee, <laughs> where they remained until 1840. So at this point in time, he becomes a physician for a plantation and had a partnership in a large practice among rich plantations. So it seems like he's just covering plantations for the area in general. Um, so he's their doc. Sims became known for his operations on club feet, cleft palates, and crossed eyes. This was his first experience treating enslaved black women 
whose owner summoned Sims specifically to treat them, and being a plantation physician was not as lucrative as Sims hoped it would be for his new life as a doctor. Mm -hmm. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) But treating women at this time, like, wasn't quite as common because... Not at all. Yeah, there weren't gynecologists yet. And a lot of crazy because there have been women around for so long, for so many years. Who would have thought? And I guess a lot of physicians, you know, didn't know that much about the female anatomy and stuff. Sure. But Sims was ready to leave behind a legacy and just. He seems like he has no problem at all Mm-mm. diving in, no. no matter how unqualified he actually no. is. Not at all. So 1840, Sims is 27 years old. Um, He's in Montgomery, starts his practice with a focus on enslaved women and their babies. And he basically opens up his practice in his home or in his own backyard. And he starts the surgical infirmary for Negroes. Um, One of his first patients was a slave woman who was 17 years old named Amika. Anika, excuse me, and she had recently given birth. So at this point, yeah, there wasn't much gynecology, that kind of practice going on. So James is ready to experiment, see what's going on, see what he can do to give these ladies attention. And he discovered that Anika was suffering from, I'm going to butcher this. I should have practiced the term before we started. I can say it. Go for it. Vesicovaginal fistula. There you go. I think it sounds like a Harry Potter spell. Spell. (laughs) Vesicovaginal fistula. Exactly. It sounds like You guys, and I use my my imaginary wand for that. There's actually a ruler right there, Dolan. I'm just kidding. Don't pass it to me. (laughs) I wonder what that spell would do. Oh, no. (laughs) Takes a woman, hopefully. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, so from here on out, I'm going to f- refer to it as VVF. The Harry Potter spell. <laughs> and this was a result of complications during childbirth that led to incontinence. So women would no longer have control of their bladder because there was tissue between the vagina and the bladder that needed repair that got ripped during childbirth. So there was also Lucy and Betsy, two more slaves that were suffering from VVF. James Sims agreed to take all three of these slaves under his wing. Um, He provided housing and would feed them um, so that he could also have them around to basically experiment on and, you know, see if he could find a cure learn from experiment on yeah mm. sadly but that's i mean i know so how, how, how it was done back then it's sad though not saying it makes it right at all um so in order to treat vvf he had to create the first ever speculum which he used a pewter soup spoon <laughs> and that sounds painful I'm going to look up a pewter soup spoon. <laughs> hold, hold on. I will say on Wikipedia, there's like a picture of what he uses, and it just okay. doesn't seem hold, viable. Hold, hold on. <laughs> I mean, just one, or does he use two? Well, in the picture that I saw, he like folds it. Interesting. Okay, so it can on. then open Um. so he can have room to work. Hold on. Let me look. Oh, I'm. Oh, oh. Intr- I think this was a bad idea. <laughs> I think his idea is a bad idea. He was trying. He's trying to be revolutionary. Mm, smaller. Can we, can we be revolutionary can it be smaller? on a smaller scale? <laughs> on a much smaller scale. Yes. Whoa, moving on. So he tried um, creating the first speculum. Wow. Poor Lucy is yeah. one of the first ones that Sims decides to conduct this procedure or experiment on without any sort of anesthesia. And so he's 
in there doing his thing for about an hour and this poor girl is suffering through all of this dylan i want to ex- describe this to you it's like a football goal about just show him the picture <laughs> actually no i was kind of enjoying you describing it <laughs> it's like a really like this is i know you know you're married you know about women women's anatomy you know <laughs> you know that this is not helping anybody for any reason at all that is what he used as a speculum so that's holding the lady open Her vaginal canal open it looks like a uh, fancy handle that you'd put on a, <laughs> on a drawer drawer <laughs> but, <laughs> it bigger. but it bends <laughs> but yeah, bigger but bigger that uh, unnecessary period yeah okay I guess also around this time frame, there was, I don't know where this stereotype came from that people of color had a higher pain tolerance. So he used that as an excuse to just keep going despite Mm. her probably screaming in agony while she was also being like strapped down while going through this surgery. No, thank you. And there were other physicians, other men in the room you know obviously that's also what they did back then they would all just be in a room and kind of observe and learn together Mm -hmm. and i don't know exactly what he was doing during the surgery because it didn't fix the problem but she she lived um she almost died from it so he was using this speculum or spoon and then a sponge to absorb any blood or urine and using an unsanitary or yeah unsterilized sponge created Mm, a bacterial infection infection. so um she had a terrible recovery for about three months three months yeah before and she was just like on bed rest um, before they realized she still had VVF and, you know, she beat the infection at least. But the tissue with VVF becomes necrotic and dies. And that's what it leaves a hole. And that's how all that the leakage from the bladder, it makes them incontinent and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So figuring out how to repair that is a sponge is not yeah gonna do it. Well, I think he just had it there just to absorb, Mm -hmm. you know, as it was, as she was leaking, basically. This sounds awful, and I'm glad that I'm a woman today. Yeah, not back then. So he decided to keep trying other solutions um, on other enslaved women. He started using opium to help calm the patients down before surgery, and he blessings, would... Blessings, really, a blessing. Uh, I guess it's something. Not good for you, but... Well, and, you know, during this, some of those women also started developing um, addictions mm-hmm. to opium. Yeah. But I guess the thought was there. And he would provide them with just enough food and water to keep them alive, which I don't know if maybe that's because he didn't have the funds for a lot of food or water maybe there was a more sinister reasoning for him giving them just enough food and water to survive but Mm. clearly they were weak too to go into surgery a hard way to recover from a big surgery though too is if you're not having proper Mm nutrients yeah nutrients like you can't your body doesn't even have a fighting chance to recover and basically when you're weak like that and you go have a surgery like you just now worsened the problem Mm mm-hmm yeah so all of these things considered these ladies were definitely dying um anika lucy and betsy though are still alive and they are kind of in this entire story okay but yeah some other slaves were dying from his surgeries um he basically had an unlimited supply of test subjects and he began he also began working on publishing a biography and a bunch of medical documents as he started going through all of these surgeries and experiments and medical findings Uh, eventually another infant was brought to him who was 
incredibly stiff. He had never seen that before. And this was a symptom of neonatal tetanus. And neonatal tetanus could be caused from the umbilical cord being cut with a non-sterile instrument. Um, We don't really see it that often in the U.S., but it is more common in other third world countries. I looked up a picture of an infant that had this too. And yeah, the basically like the neck, the spine, like the, the baby is just stiff. Hmm. So James was determined to find a cure and investigate what was going on. And there sadly wasn't much that could be done because when babies have this, they also can't feed very well. So I am so distracted by this now that it has hands on it. How <laughs> wide does he think it needs to be i don't know who knows like how wide it really was horrified alicia's looking at other pictures of the like it now that it's in someone's hands like what where are you gonna put that (laughs) (laughs) i'm sorry i am very distracted by this (laughs) i mean the human body is an amazing thing but that's a little unnecessary that is that is cruel yeah so back to the baby (laughs) back to the poor baby so the baby sadly does die. Mm. There's really nothing you can do for it. Yeah. After the infant passed away, um, Sims was granted permission to do an autopsy, which basically just led to him, you know, experimenting more. I don't know what specific things were found, um, but Sims decided to publish his findings claiming he found a cure it had something to like while he was doing the autopsy on the baby i think he found some sort of cyst or tumor of some sort on the spine Mm. but that wasn't like you can't just find that and cut it out and say it's a cure but i think he claimed that that was a cure okay after the baby was passed Mm -hmm. yeah because the baby passed away he did an autopsy and that's when he like found something on the spine and maybe he just claimed that maybe if you just cut this out that it would cure it. it. I'm just speculating. I don't know. I'm making speculating. <laughs> yes. That. That's all I can think about. <laughs> <laughs> so he publishes his findings and um this leads to the death deaths of many more children because people think he has a cure to things and he really doesn't. Um, the, his medical peers begin to realize th- his prejudice practice because he rarely treated or killed white women or children. He was mm. only doing these things on slaves and women of color. So Sims, despite his doubts of other medical professionals, wanted to leave behind a legacy regardless of what anyone was saying. In the 1840s, he decided it was time to start utilizing assistance more, including um, Anaka, um, Betsy, and Lucy, who underwent their VVF surgeries that failed, and they still survived, and they're still, I guess, living with Sims. They never went back to their plantation. Um, that seems weird. Yeah, maybe he wanted to keep them, or maybe he ended up enslaving them himself. Who knows? For I know sure. he had one of his own. I think her name was Delia. Mm. But I'm just like thinking about you know, and I'm my own rating. Like he didn't like when we're talking about opium. Like I guess anesthesia wasn't quite popular yet, but he didn't even know about like the use of ether. Yeah. And it was quite popular at this time. It's like he's so closed off. Like what if, what kind of doctor could he have been if he like continued his education and like reached out or networked or, hey, you know, so-and-so doctor in this town, what do you think? Like he's just like so ignorant and self-absorbed into his own thing that it's so, so bad. Yeah. Okay. So we do... He does eventually figure out how to cure VVF, surprisingly. So he uses... Shit, he's been at it long enough. I know. So he uses Anika as a um, assistant. Um, yeah, making sure I'm saying her name right. Because it's spelled Anarka. In mm-hmm. some ways, it's spelled Anarka, but it's pronounced Anika. Anyway, so 
I don't know exactly how he figures out this technique, but his new innovative technique to cure VVF is to use a silver wire. And he, like, even consults a jeweler to, like, see how the silver is going to work with the body, basically. And during a procedure, Anika (laughs) is actually the first one to undergo the procedure. She's not just um, a medical assistant anymore. He uses her for the first procedure. And she's held down and... um, The silver wire is inserted somehow. I'm not exactly sure how it works in there, Mm -hmm. what all he does. And then he also uses a catheter to monitor infection. So basically, as long as the urine continues to come out clear, that means that there's no sign of infection. And she's just bedridden until she is well enough. So, after so much time, Sims examines Anika and discovers that he did it. Her VVF was healed. And then after that, after he does start curing these slaves' VVF, um, they can return to their plantations. And he performed the same method, or used the same method on Betsy and Lucy, And then, of course, he writes a paper on his findings, and he claims he was doing these successful operations on white women, and not that he was experimenting on colored slaves in front of a whole bunch of men, basically. So he's kind of glorifying himself, making it seem like everything he was doing was, Mm I don't know, PC, I guess. (laughs) And then after this victory, if you will, he decides to take his success to New York City. In New York City, um, he teaches a few other doctors and gynecologists this method, so he really was, I guess, the grandfather of gynecology in a way like it some things you read like they refer to him as that they also refer to him as the butcher yeah and they compare <laughs> him to joseph mengla yeah because he was experimenting on people the nazi doctor Mm-hmm. so it's just kind of nuts but we'll get into that. I know, but <sighs> props to An- Anika, Lucy, and Betsy mm-hmm. for hanging in there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, geez. I mean, what else could you do in those times, sadly? Um, so Nothing. <laughs> in 1855, while he's in New York City, he does help find the women's hospital, um, the first ever women's hospital. But before that, um, he does kind of... I don't know, it seems like his health declines a little bit and he suffers from some sort of melancholy. I don't really understand why or what all is happening there. Um, but he's working with some other doctors that he befriended in New York City. Um, but those doctors start to put pieces together and look into his background and realize that he has such a negative reputation. Um, so maybe it's maybe it's guilt that's like weighing on his mental health or something. I don't really know. Um, May 1st, 1855, that's when the first women's hospital is opened. Also around this time, there's a new wave of subjects for experiments, basically, um, because at this time, there's a bunch of Irish immigrants coming into the U.S. So there's a lot of female Irish immigrants that come to this hospital and he continues to do procedures on. Mm -hmm. Um, Because of his new fame, he is able to also travel the world and his hospital is thriving even in his absence. He decides to return to the U.S. in 1868 after the Civil War. And then in 1876, um, he is 
proclaimed to be the president of the American Medical Association and the president of the Gynecology Society. In 1883, he tried finishing his biography, but he ends up not completing it himself because he dies of a heart attack. So his son ends up finishing his biography. Mm. And then statues of James Sims do get erected in New York City um, despite his dark past and malpractice. Eventually, this is all brought to light. You know, there was... You know, 2010, 2016, there were a lot of rights and everything going on to remove statues like that. You know, mm-hmm. same thing with like the Robert E. Lee statue. And just as people started realizing more of the dark past associated with these statues, there were petitions and riots going on to try and get these things taken down. In 2016, one of the riots, um, a lot of the rioters were just shouting the names Anika Betsy Lucy in the streets and then April 2017 his statue was finally taken down we know of 12 black women that were documented to have underwent his experiments or surgeries but obviously it was many many more who knows how many weren't documented I think that I can see both sides, right? Because it's good for medicine, but terrible for the people in the moment. It Mm -hmm. wasn't ethical. I don't think ethics were a big idea in the 1800s. Right. You know, so I just think, I feel very, very much for these women and thank them for, you know, their, I know they didn't have a choice, but... You know, I don't know. It's such a tough situation, and I don't think that we should be experimenting on people without their consent and all that stuff, you know. But mm-hmm. yeah, at the I same am grateful time. for modern gynecology. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know exactly where the new statues were put up, but um, there were statues put up of Betsy, Lucy, and Anika. Good. And these three ladies became known as the mothers of gynecology. I like that much better. Yes, absolutely. I agree. And everything that you said about him being, would you say, an Aquarius? Yes, an Aquarius born on that January day. 25th. <laughs> yeah. I feel like all that just definitely checks out. Yeah, so cloaked in mystery, difficult to know, holding something in reserve, dreamy, introspective, Charming, profound sense of destiny, which I think his destiny in his mind was to make money. Yeah. But I don't know if that's quite what he achieved, but science. He also had, just random side note, he also had a lot of freaking kids. I wrote down, so he was married to Teresa Jones, and then throughout his life, he had nine children altogether. I don't know if they were all Dang. with Teresa or not, but... <laughs> I don't know, I just saw a list of all the kids' names. I'm like, gosh, that's a lot of kids. But I don't know, some families, I guess nine isn't a lot of kids, too. I think it's a lot of kids. I think it's a <laughs> lot of kids. It's a lot of, a lot of kiddos. Dolan, do you think that's a lot of kids or no? I am the oldest of nine. I know. Oh, are, really? That's, yes. I know so, Dolan has a ton of siblings. That's why yeah. I'm asking. I didn't, Dolan. I didn't know it was nine exactly. It's a lot of kids. I, mean, I, knew there, I thought there was seven, but nine is... So tell yeah. me, does it feel like a lot or no? Um, it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Especially lot. being the oldest, yeah, I'm sure it's, it's like a lot for you. Every year is like a graduation and like it's, yeah, it's it's a lot. Jeez. At least they're graduating. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well. <laughs> all right. All right. Cool. Well, but t- by today's standards, nine kids would be a lot of kids. <laughs> yes. So. But, wow. That was. Honestly, that was that one was very interesting. Like Mm -hmm. reading it for myself before we did the podcast is one thing, but like once we start discussing it, you know, it really takes a life of its own in my brain, and I'm like, wow, Mm -hmm. the story is much more than I thought. Even just reading it on Mm -hmm. paper, so yeah, that's James Marion Sims. No more experimenting on women, people, babies. Period. Let's not do that. I mean, like if it's an ethical clinical trial, then do your thing, but. Yeah. Cool. Next oh, time, man. who are we? D- we don't know who we're talking about next we time. We have some ideas for next yeah. time, but we're still, 
digging through that. We're doing a little bit more research beforehand to see, you know, Mm -hmm. what we've got and what we don't have. So, um, again, it'll be a surprise apparently. And (laughs) we, we say that a lot now. Um, so I hope that you, um, enjoyed this, even though it was like a harder episode to listen to maybe, but, um, it's always good back, good to go back in time, listen to history and then gain some perspective for today and some gratitude. Absolutely. For sure. All right, stay tuned. In two weeks, we'll have another one out. See ya. Murder. Thank you for listening to Healthcare Horrors, brought to you by Atlas Medstaff. Just a reminder, we are not healthcare professionals. We are just fans of true crime, talking about some of history's darkest moments in healthcare. Stay tuned, stay healthy, and stay safe.